Uh, hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, for, those that don't, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Emil Carstens and I am the Centaur President. Uh, we represent people. Um, so the Best of Bristol series is a way went to the University of Exeter doing an undergraduate degree in biological sciences. He then did his PhD there and moved on to the Health Protection Agency. Uh, for nine years. He then, in 2006, was uh, a Best of Bristol speaker. So, first of all, his enthusiasm, like his study area, is infectious. <laughs> uh, um, with puppetry skills to rival, <laughs> to rival those of any cast member of Sesame Street. Um, he really does go the extra mile to step outside the box and uh, with that, I introduce Dr. Tristan Cogan. Thank you. <clears throat> Emil, thank you. I knew I should have put more gore in today. So, um, thank you to those of you who voted for me. It's an honor to be asked to do this lecture, especially because I assumed that I was just grossing people out with most of my lectures. So normally, I give a diet of death, destruction, depression, and feces. So it was with considerable surprise that I got an email asking me to do one of these lectures. So what I'm, today, rather than give the normal death and destruction, I'm going to try and be hopeful for possibly the first lecture in my entire life. Normally, it's a complete diet of fear. Today, I'm going to bring you hope and why we're still here. When I was asked to give the lecture, I wondered what I could do. And essentially, this is the question that after two years of me lecturing at everybody, the end of the third year, we get to. It's bemused faces all around the lecture theater after I've told you about 50 different ways in which an animal can possibly kill you. How are we actually still alive? So this is a response to all of you who've sat through my lectures. Here, this is the Great Plague. I told you I like death and destruction. This is the big granddaddy of them all. The Great Plague up in London. The illustration here is an engraving done at the time showing um, how people in London treated their dead at the top with great respect, getting very close to them and looking after people. Whereas the nasty old country people I have considerable sympathy for lecturing down at Langford, dragging the dead off and dumping them in a pit. And we all know who came off worst out of the whole Great Plague, don't we? London did not do so well. But more of this, more of the death, I promise you, as I always say in my lectures, in just a moment. So, we are completely outnumbered. The reason I like lecturing in microbiology is because it's so completely unpredictable. Nasty things happen. I need a couple of volunteers. We are outnumbered on Earth. Volunteer there? Nick, thank you very much. There are, can we take that in, please? There are, there we go. There are this many people on Earth, okay? About seven trillion people in the population. Now, if you wonder how likely it is that you can get a disease, or there's one of those viruses or bacteria out there are going to kill you. And Emil, I need your help for this one, please. This is exactly how many bacteria and viruses there are. Not exactly, I haven't counted. This is approximately, now can you take that in please? This is approximately how many bacteria and viruses there are on Earth. You might need to come this way, they're going to be going for quite a while. <laughs> keep moving, Emil, keep moving. So this is the number. One times 10 to the 31. Again, it's an approximation. Someone with far more patience than me has actually counted them. But the, so the chances are that at some point in our life we're going to meet something rather dangerous. But just to give you an idea, they're not all that lethal. There are. Thank you to both my beautiful assistants. 
So, at some point in your life, you're going to meet something that makes you sick. These things exist out there. There are approximately 230,000 species of viruses that make you sick. I normally lecture on bacteriology, but it's the viruses, really, that give you the exciting diseases. Now, if you're an avid reader of the Daily Express, as I am, you see these sort of headlines fairly often. Never a week seems to pass without a disease being threatened to kill us all. So we'll go for something fairly recent, fairly close to home, swine flu. Diseases seem to pop up all the time. It never seems, though, in the end, that whatever the latest disease is, swine flu, Ebola, Zika, going back further, BSC and CJD, that was meant to wipe out about a quarter of the population at one point, it never quite seems to happen. Whether this is a problem with epidemiology or a problem with the Daily Express is a point outside this lecture. But we get these sort of headlines. Experts, we'll test the experts. I'm an expert's prediction. Death toll reaches 29. This isn't it's lethal as most things I lecture on. Swine flu, 350 people killed each day. Does anybody have an idea how many people swine flu killed in total in the UK while it was here? It's got to be big, right? This is going to be dangerous. This was going to kill us all. 360 over the entire course of the disease. These things pop up. They seem very frightening at the beginning. They spread very quickly at the beginning, but then they just seem to peter out in very unexciting fashion. And there is a reason for this. There's an evolutionary reason, which is what I will be coming to during this talk. SARS, okay, cast your mind a bit further back. SARS, respiratory syndrome, started off in the Far East. Flights were being met, flights were being cancelled from countries with SARS. They were being met, people having their temperatures monitored. If anyone sneezed, everybody moved about five meters away from them. So SARS in the US was the big one going to kill everybody. 774. So these things come, they're exciting, they disappear. They come and they go. So in there, there is a message of hope. These things aren't as bad as they at first seem they could be. But have we just been lucky? That's the question I want to explore. Is it just a matter of time until one of these diseases gets out there, makes the jump, appears in humans, spreads, and gets us all? Okay, we'll go for the big one here. Okay, Ebola. Ebola, absolutely lethal, okay? Liquefies people. It spreads to the UK. We were all sure at one point this was going to spread globally. It's going to spread throughout the UK. This was finally going to wipe out humanity. There is only one killer that I can think of that is more dangerous than Ebola. One bigger killer than Ebola. Looking at the statistics, over the last 10 years, in Africa, the biggest killer is the hippopotamus. <laughs> we don't panic about hippopotamuses. We do panic about these diseases that pop up. And I did the statistics, because I like my background research. Hippos, brackets, in Africa, obviously, we don't have a massive hippo problem in Bristol. <laughs> so we do the statistics recently. West Africa here. Hippos in Africa kill 2,990 people on average per year. Ebola, at its very height, was killing 3,770. So while Ebola's out there, it is slightly more deadly than a hippo. It is, in fact, 1.3 times as dangerous as a hippopotamus. And that should put these diseases in perspective. When they first emerge, we don't know a lot about them. We don't understand them. We don't understand their spread. These sort of diseases are by their very nature, new to us. We can't understand how they're going to spread. A lot of the time, we don't really understand where they come from. They get into the population. We cannot understand how to control them very early on, and people get scared. But to put it in perspective, think of a humble hippopotamus. So I promised to bring you hope. 
okay? There are worse things out there in life. But why is it that these diseases suddenly pop up? Well, if we look back in history, diseases back in the old days used to be a lot more lethal, okay? We go back to the plague, the Great Plague of London. On the right-hand side, the Plague of Athens. Nobody quite knows what the Plague of Athens was, but it was deadly. This is an engraving of the angel of death knocking on the door. Exactly the same story. We don't have endemic plague spreading throughout the globe, killing off the cities anymore, do we? These diseases pop up, they die out. I will risk calling plague a dismal failure as a killer disease. It hasn't wiped us out. So where can we look for success stories? Evolutionarily, diseases that come in, kill everybody, and disappear are an evolutionary dead end. They've made the jump into a new house. They've moved into people, and then they are gone. It's obviously not a good thing to do. Where can we look for success? Can anybody identify that? Cash prize if you can. This is the common cold, or representation of the common cold. The cold is a success story. It's caused by the rhinovirus. This is exactly what success looks like. The cold has made the jump into people, it's evolved in people, and it's very easily spread. This is usually the point at which someone starts coughing, thank you, right on cue. <laughs> usually where the coughs and the sniffles start at this point. This is an absolute success story. Okay? We want to look for successful disease. We shouldn't be looking at the plagues and the Ebolas and the sort of stuff that gets in the Daily Mail. We should be looking at the sort of thing that is there all the time. It's, it sticks in people, it transmits, it spreads, and it makes you a bit ill. And if we go back in a moment to looking at Ebola, we'll see why this is such a success story. That's why I tried to take photos of my own children, none of which had colds for the first time ever. It is a success because it spreads. Large amounts of viruses are spread onto surfaces. It survives in the environment. The key thing is, this little vector there is still mobile, still able to move around spreading hands and snot over the outside world and everybody that he meets. You can move, you can sneeze. Now, the big difference is Ebola. If we go back to some of those diseases, Ebola, plague, things that make you very sick, things that make you not want to move are not going to spread. By virtue of the fact that they make you very ill and you'll lie down, either because you feel sick or you're entirely forced to lie down with Ebola, you're not going to move, you're not going to spread, you will not easily meet others, and this completely limits transmission. So the evolutionary key to surviving and spreading is keeping your host mobile. There is a very powerful evolutionary driver towards not killing the hand that feeds you, or indeed hosts you. If you want to evolve, don't make your host too sick. This is a tree of the evolution of the rhinovirus. There are many, many, many different types of what we call the common cold, the rhinovirus that causes it. So, from very early on, the first organism to appear from wherever the common cold appeared from, I don't know, I'm not sure anybody knows where it came from originally, but the first organism that made the jump in the hope that by leaping into primate, human, whatever was around at that point, it would hope that it could cling on. It clearly has. It's been successful, it's clung on, and it's passed from human to human, and it's evolved and it's changed, and it's adapted to its human host. Many, many different ways, different types found in different parts of the planet. So, it's a remarkably successful little organism. It's just not the sort of thing we get excited about. But in terms of disease, almost as successful um, in terms of deaths, 
several hundred deaths from rhinovirus typical in the winter in the UK. Put against the sort of deaths we're seeing from some of the other diseases, it's actually quite good. It doesn't kill often, but it spreads through the population and only takes out the weak. So the big question is, given things like the common cold, the occasional touch of Ebola, how have we actually survived this long? It's what I wanted to come to here. It's because, as I say, diseases come in, they flare, and they die. Diseases do not last in people. I'm going to take you back a bit further. For those of you who remember the 1980s, luminous socks and HIV, a human immunodeficiency virus, absolutely rampant in, in the 1980s, yet another one that was going to be an enormous killer. Again, like the common cold, it's an organism that has made the jump into humans and has evolved to pass human to human. So it spreads very well. There is evidence now that HIV itself is becoming weaker. In the 1980s, it was a strapping teenager that was going out very actively passing from person to person and very quickly killing. This is clearly an evolutionary dead end. So imagine how many viruses there are. And I showed you just now, 10, 10 to the 31 viruses on this planet. There are a lot of these things. Within that population, there's huge possibilities to mutate and to change. Individual, even in with, within a body, an individual virus can try, a mutation can be tried on. If it doesn't fit and the virus dies, the overall population has lost almost nothing. So mutations in these organisms occur very quickly. They alter their genetic material. If they alter their genetic material, this is pure Darwinism, then they alter their ability to do something which may make them slightly fitter than their compatriots. If they do that, they can infect more, they can survive for longer. So this is drive towards becoming the perfect organism. If HIV emerged in the 1970s, in widespread in the population in the 80s, then this is something it's still doing. It came in very hot. It didn't burn itself out. It managed not to kill too many people at the beginning. It didn't kill all the people that had it, so it could be passed on. If it was something like Ebola, it probably wouldn't have spread. So, slightly less virulent. And there is evidence now that HIV is evolving in some areas towards a less virulent form. It doesn't make the host as ill. The host survives for slightly longer. So whilst we are putting a lot of effort into treatment, at the same time, we have changes going on in the organism. They are adapting to be the fittest that they can be. And that fitness encompasses everything that their host does. Who does their host meet? How does their host move around? Who do they contact? Is whoever they contact actually susceptible? So it's this huge arms race of evolution going on with every single virus that we've got, every single bacterium inside us all the time, and these things are changing. And this, I said in the abstract for the talk, an organism makes the jump into people. If it survives that initial tricky adolescence where it tries to adapt to its new host, it will slip into this sort of rather comfortable middle age, where it becomes slightly less exciting than it was when it was younger goes to bed earlier at night, slightly less energy, and it will live far more comfortably with its host. And this is the sort of driver that we see. That after this initial jump event, we see the slip into rather comfortable coexistence. So in an individual host, we'll take the common cold in ourselves. These things are the peak of their evolutionary tree. They mutate quickly, they change quickly. If they could get better, they probably would have got better. So the cold that I have is probably the best a cold can be. Now, if my cat was to catch the cold from me, that's going to be a difficult jump to make. I'm not very like a cat. The cat does different things to me. The cat is made different. I'm not a vet. It's my usual... Um, warning at the beginning of lectures. I am at a vet school. I am not a vet. I understand that cats are different to me. 
I understand not the detail. But to change from something that can infect a me to something that can infect my cat is incredibly costly. Because it's evolved for me. It's not evolved for my cat. It will have to do different things. It will have to reassort things. It will have to express different abilities. The chances of that evolving, because remember, evolution is completely random. These changes occur utterly randomly. We need a whole assortment of them to occur at the same time for something to be able to be fit enough to survive in a new host. So changing is very costly, but sometimes if you become less virulent, you can be more likely to persist and spread. We'll come to some more change in just a moment. Going back to Ebola, this is Sierra Leone. This is the latest Ebola outbreak here. And you will notice there are people and they're talking to each other and they're outdoors. One of the things that characterized the book past Ebola outbreaks was that Ebola used to pop up in a population. It was incredibly virulent. It would usually then spread through that population somewhere and kill most of them. And if a disease kills you faster than you can reach the next population of people, it's not going to spread. And we have a complete evolutionary dead end. So it could pop up in an area, kill all the susceptible individuals, the disease is then killed itself and disappears. It doesn't have the chance to get into a new host. It doesn't have a chance to evolve. So what characterised the last outbreak was this kind of thing, was actually we had a slightly less virulent form, it would appear. It's the opinion at the moment, a slightly less virulent form of Ebola, that people remained mobile, people could spread it. If we go back to the Great Plague, and the original slide, people in London walking around, carrying the dead off, giving them a proper Christian burial, it's a very, very bad thing to do, it's very very good for the disease and the spread if people are mobile. So people moved about. So the control measures in Sierra Leone, perfectly sensibly, was to prevent movement. And um, movement restrictions, stopping people moving about, as if these people were sick enough to actually have to stay where they are stay in their houses, is the sort of thing that would destroy disease. We do not want a, an infected individual to meet a susceptible individual. So yet another disease that has moved towards relatively, and don't get me wrong, I'm not doing down any of these diseases, these are major killers, but they are moving in evolutionary terms towards less prevalent forms of themselves. So I did promise you hope, didn't I? There is hope in that evolution will be our saviour. It was noticeable in the last outbreak that a lot of the key spreaders of Ebola were grandparents and small children. And there were two competing theories on this. There is the theory that the old, the young, shed more of the virus. They're super shedders. They may be their immune system is less competent and they're shedding more. There's also the human angle on this one, which is if my daughter gets ill, then everybody's very concerned and rallies around. The grandparents probably turn up and we deal with it. If I get ill, nobody cares. And I stay in bed on my own. And quite honestly, I could probably die up there and nobody would ever notice. Which may be exactly what's going on here. So sometimes we get close to those that are sick simply because we care about them more than we do others. And that is essentially getting too close is where these diseases came from. That's a fruit bat. It's the likely source of Ebola. So... Ebola, in common with many diseases, hides out in an animal. So again, I come from a vet school. As the male said, I defected to the vet school, secretly on a mission to rid the world of animals. These things are dangerous. So the fruit bat, if, if the fruit bat is fine. The fruit bat does not mind having Ebola. It is somewhere to hide. If 
you get too close to a fruit bat. This is fruit bat Cully. I know it's lunchtime, and I apologize to anybody who's bought food. You can see the wing just over on that side there, sticking up. Improperly cooked fruit bat curry is a major vehicle of Ebola. So getting too close to these animals, this is how they make the jump, okay? So one doesn't normally get too close to fruit bats, and if one does, one normally cooks them proper, properly until the meat is falling off the bone. Top culinary tip for you all. Getting too close to animals gives their viral and bacterial load the very small chance of making that jump into you if there's one organism, there's a tiny chance there is one organism sitting there that has the ability, the mutations, the lack of fitness in the fruit bat that makes it slightly more adapted to people and slightly more able to make that jump. These things are constantly looking for new homes. Again, coming from a vet school, this sort of thing is bad. I've told people not to get too close to animals, but people do. People essentially after a few months probably have the same bacteria on their skin as their dog, which isn't surprising if you do that. So people get too close. The importance of this is that diseases need somewhere to hide. The real big killer diseases, things like Ebola, things like the plague, the things that suddenly appear, have to hide somewhere. They're not hiding in the population at very low levels. They're not hiding in people. They tend to hide in animals. So we have here Lyme disease, monkeypox, hantavirus, Ebola, SARS, all come from wildlife. I did borrow, I'm not suggesting that squirrels, seagulls, and deer are necessarily the most dangerous of animals. More of that in a moment. Do fear squirrels. But a lot of these things do come from wildlife hosts and livestock hosts, where they have evolved in these animals to a condition where they don't cause disease. They do not make their hosts sick. And in fact, if you look at human diseases, 70% of human diseases are zoonotic. They come from animals. I hadn't realized that until a few months ago. So actually, if we're looking for diseases of humans, we need to better understand what's in our livestock, and we need to better understand what's in our wildlife. And this is where the great era of genome sequencing and working out the complete bacterial viral population of every organism in the planet becomes useful. Somewhere sitting out there in a squirrel near you is potentially the seeds of the next outbreak. We simply don't understand enough about the great wide world out there. It's no use looking at ourselves the most dangerous stuff. Things that are circulating in us usually are not that dangerous. We need to be scared of the wildlife. And the this is, this organisms, I said, they, they change, they mutate. What is normal becomes a monster. These organisms that are perfectly innocuous, uninfectious in a squirrel. For it. I'm blaming squirrels, I apologize. I will show you more squirrels in a minute. I'm leading up to something here. Something which makes the jump, makes a hopeful jump in that by landing in a new host, it will somehow adapt. This is going on between animals at the same time. The, they are, the animal kingdom is not out to get us. There's nothing special about people. These things jump between species all the time. It's just that we notice. HIV was a successful jump. Jump from primates, monkeys, into humans, and then evolved, stuck within humans. It made that hopeful jump, and it was lucky. And it evolved, and it is currently changing within humans. I'm not going to label anything a failure, because I don't, this is being recorded, and I don't want someone to rub this in my face next year when we're all dead of Ebola, okay? So, but failures are what usually occurs. If you look at this map of where zoonotic diseases pop up, they pop up most often here in the sort of places well, that we're well set up to look for diseases. We notice them in Europe and in the US because we have a good disease surveillance system. But as you can see, they're popping up all over the place all the time. And it's a single event 
Zika, anyone? These sort of things, you know, just to sort of pop up and try something and then disappear. And I know part of it is media reporting. And Zika is so last year now, we have to find a new virus and give it a strange new name. But these things do pop up and it's not just how we perceive them. There's a genuine reason that these things will try living in humans, burn out and don't make it. I warned you about these guys. The red squirrel, the cutest of the squirrels in the UK. I said it's not just animal diseases passing to humans. Brown Sea Island, off the coast of the UK, used to be a leper colony. So people used to be sent there very sensibly, exactly like the plague in London. People were sent away onto Brown Sea Island to die. It's colonised with red squirrels. You can see where this one's going. It's one of the last bastions now of the red squirrel because the greys can't get there. For whatever reason, the red squirrels have picked up leprosy. I don't know whether squirrels dig that deep or if there's simply a large amount of... People were buried there at the time. Whether there's just a large amount of um, bacteria in the environment, but the squirrels have got leprosy there. So a human disease has now jumped into squirrels. So it's not just them infecting us, it is also us infecting them. And there was nothing sadder, I couldn't find a picture, I didn't want to depress you, than a squirrel with leprosy. So it, it cuts both ways for all of us. But we tend to be scared, scared of zoonotic diseases. We're not scared of diseases we recognise that other people have all the time. These things are new, they're strange, we don't understand them. So it's Shambo the Bull. Shambo was a, was, you see where this one's going now, Shambo was a sacred bull. It's a Hindu sacred bull, and like all cattle in the UK, was tested for bovine tuberculosis. Shambo failed his test. So bovine TB, another fantastic example of a disease that is reasonably widespread, has something of an effect on cattle. It's carried by many different species. Our wildlife is fairly endemic in wildlife, certainly in this part of the country. And poor old Shambo got it. And we're afraid of this. We need to control this. We put all of our best efforts into controlling these sort of diseases because the idea of something unknown leaping at us from an animal scares us. Shambo was, after quite a lot of tussles, eventually slaughtered. Shambo doesn't meet other cattle. He stays on his own. He's sacred. He lived in a barn on his own. The offers were made by the monks to keep him separating from cows, but such is the fear of disease that uh, he was eventually compulsorily slaughtered, and it took a very, very large number of police officers to assist with that one. So we are scared. This is spraying for Zika. We put an enormous amount of effort into destroying these things when they pop up. And we probably should. By their very nature, zoonotic diseases are unpredictable. But it is vanishingly unlikely, in evolutionary terms, that they are going to go on and ever be the massive zombie-like pandemic that kills us all. They make great news. But in reality, there is this evolutionary driver that is what is keeping us all safe. So that being the case, the fact that diseases burn themselves out, could we just put our feet up the next disease outbreak? Leave it. It'll burn itself out. It worked for the plague. The plague disappeared. There were no antibiotics around then. Can we just wait? Would we actually be prepared to play chicken with Ebola? I think not at the moment. But it's my guess that if we did with any of these things, they are very, very, very unlikely to actually spread through humanity. The saving graces, though, to all these diseases, if 
something makes that leap and is very virulent, we tend to notice. It's not like the cold where it's a bit sniffly, we can't quite tell what it is. Diseases that are very virulent and are very likely to spread quickly by their nature. Okay, so we've got Ebola causes hemorrhage. We have diseases that cause massive diarrhea. Diarrhea and blood, I'm getting back to my normal lecture territory. Diarrhea and blood and hemorrhage are fantastic ways of spreading yourself in the environment. If your host dies, at least make a mess of them first. So whoever comes to clear them up gets themselves infected as well. These are transmission mechanisms. This is why bacteria and viruses can spread. It does mean we tend to notice them. Being noticed invites treatment and invites intervention. And although I say we could gamble with the future of all humanity by putting our feet up, we are able to intervene. There is vaccination, antivirals, antibiotics. There are ways of stopping outbreaks before they spread. So the future actually, although it almost pains me to say it, is actually rather hopeful. It would appear that, you know, given the very nature of these sort of diseases, they aren't the sort of thing that's going to wipe us all out very, very quickly overnight. Humanity can save itself. But evolution of the pathogen itself, I would argue, the very nature of adaptation and the pathogen wanting to survive and wanting to be the best it can is what will save us in the end, just incredibly slowly. So treatment buys us time, evolution in the end will save us. So there is hope. My top tips for surviving the apocalypse, if it ever comes, so take these away with you, if you will. Don't work with children or animals. Both are absolutely lethal. I've worked in human medicine for the Health Protection Agency. I've worked at the vet school for a long time. Um, so I have nothing to choose between either children or... No offence. <laughs> There is nothing to choose between either as a vector of disease. So stay away from them. Remain calm and stay indoors. So the plague sort of worked, didn't it? So people shut themselves up inside and hid. Works rather well. A very elementary business. Although, as we saw in the first slide at the beginning, stay indoors. You won't meet anybody with the disease, but it's all rather uncivilised, isn't it? Leaving all those dead people outside. Be very, very patient and wait for your attacker to evolve, you'll be fine. And my argument is, so I said I've worked with animals, I've worked with children. Of all of these things, clearly I'm a microbiology lecturer, I prefer my bacteria and viruses. They come in peace, they don't mean to hurt you. It's all a complete accident. Ebola was just a hideous accident. These things are not attempting to hurt you. It doesn't suit them to hurt you. They have killed themselves in doing it. And this is why, of the 10 to the 31 viruses, similar number of bacteria that exist on Earth, most of them aren't coming to get you. And I just want you to remember at the end, there are worse problems than disease. Please think of the hippo. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Tristan, for this amazing lecture. Um, of the 10 to the 31 viruses, how many of them are bacteriophages, or are they all animal attackers? Go of viruses to bacteria is about two to one and there are far fewer people than that. It is very likely that a lot age. One issue with those is, again, they have a similar ability to occasionally, one in a trillion chance, of accidentally infecting. Is there another question? Back over there. Like a pathogen is to evolve to be less virulent to the host, is us interfering with antivirals, etc., making it worse? Treatment on very sick individuals 
we tend to be treating the, the anodyne forms of disease. Um, okay, uh, thank you all for coming. And I would just like to remind you that we all have a lecture tonight. <laughs>